recording. Okay, so sometime last week we talked about partial pressures of gases and um, what happened as you went up into atmosphere and there became less and less uh, air and less and less weight on top of you and that changed the concentration of gas. Do you remember all that? Yeah, okay. So now I just wanna talk a little bit about the opposite direction going underwater for just a little bit. So um, in terms of the, the pressures that we talked about, it's the same when we increase pressure as it was when we decreased pressure in terms of the overall, just the general process, right? So if you remember, we talked about if you go underwater, every 33 feet of seawater and every 34 feet of fresh water, you are increasing your pressure by one complete atmosphere. So uh, if you remember, we had, um, uh, as we went underwater, 33 feet, they gave us two atmospheres of pressure um, or 1,520 uh, millimeters of mercury of overall total air pressure. It also changed our, um, our pressure of O2 to three, basically 320 um, tor of partial pressure of O2. So basically when you're going to 33 feet and you take a breath, you're breathing in a partial pressure of O2 equivalent to 320 millimeters of mercury pressure. So <clears throat> needless to say, breathing underwater is no big deal as long as you have an air source. Our air source, of course, is coming from a pressurized tank, um, which is just air. So scuba divers, I think we talked about this before, but scuba divers are only breathing air, not only, but for our, our topic of conversation right now, they're breathing air. So all, all they do is they take a scuba tank and they take uh, an air compressor and they fill that tank with um, clean air. And when I say clean air, I mean, they make sure that it doesn't have moisture in it or anything that'll cause the air um, to cause corrosion to the tank or anything to that effect. And the tanks have to be serviced every so often to make sure that there isn't any sort of buildup of anything within the tank. So um, they're breathing pressurized air. That means everything that we've talked about in terms of the partial pressures and the percentages of those gases still holds true. So when someone is underwater breathing that air, um, we've got a, a few different concerns that come to mind, all right? Um, one of those concerns is the fact that you are breathing a higher partial pressure of oxygen. Now, in a normal, healthy individual, we, we talked before about um, providing oxygen to somebody who doesn't need oxygen, right? If you provide oxygen to somebody who doesn't need that oxygen and they're healthy, like presumably all of you are right now, right? Um, you are going to create those, there are going to be chemical reactions that will, that will lead to reactive oxygen species formation and your body is going to have to get rid of those and manage those. In a healthy individual, we can do that and it's not too big of a deal. In an unhealthy person, that's where problems come into play. So for example, if someone has, is going through a myocardial infarction where they already have heart tissue that is damaged because of ischemia, and then you add to that chemicals that break down more tissue and those chemicals get to that portion of the heart, we just perpetuate the problem. So we wanna be careful about making sure that we provide O2 only when it's necessary in patients. Okay, when you go underwater, presumably the person's healthy. Let's just start with a healthy person going underwater. Breathing compressed air is no big deal, but, re but remember that they are still taking, uh, they're still taking in that same partial pressure of, of um, or that same percentage of O2 at a higher pressure. That higher pressure does, in, does mean that there's gonna be more oxygen, and we're gonna get into the other gas in a minute, but more oxygen dissolved in the plasma. So you're gonna go above and beyond what is necessary for saturation. Um, there's some good and bad to that. The good to that is that really uh, breathing underwater with a scuba tank is not a big deal. Um, and by saying, when I say it's not a big deal, I mean the, the person doesn't 
typically feel like they're going to run out of air when they're breathing underwater. Um, there is a lot of anxiety for people who are not used to that and they're first learning. And that tends to mean that they breathe, they start to hyperventilate underwater. So they're breathing faster and deeper underwater and they will burn through their air faster and will have to stop their trip sooner to go get their tanks refilled. But from the standpoint of ease of taking a breath, it's, it's relatively easy to, to take a breath and to breathe with that air underwater. Does that make sense so far? Okay, there are a few things to consider, however. <laughs> uh, is that due to the pressure on the chest? Uh, Mariah, is what due to the pressure on the chest? What do you mean by that? And feel free to, uh, no, 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 yeah, okay, excellent question. I think I understand what you're getting at. Let me know if I, if I don't answer this correct, correctly. Um, there is increased pressure on our body, but that's not the reason why we are breathing, that we're hyperventilating. The reason that people hyperventilate when scuba diving is, is because of anxiety. They're underwater in a place where you're not supposed to typically be breathing and they're breathing. And so they are, they tend to be nervous. Um, experienced scuba divers don't burn through their air. Um, yeah, ex experienced scuba divers will moderate their breathing uh, and they um, will actually use far, far less air and they will have more than enough air in their tank when they come back up uh, than they actually, uh, than, than they could have, uh, than they needed. In other words, um, there's other considerations about staying underwater for a period of time um, and they will, those considerations will come into play. I'll talk about this in a minute those considerations will come into play before they'll run out of air. So yes, panic is, is really the reason why they start to hyperventilate. Um, and it's, you, you, it's fun, you, you, you tell, you know, you take a new person underwater and you know, it's, it's nerve wracking. They, they take the first breath under there and they, they're thinking about the fact that they've got 30 feet in front of them and um, their, their, ment their mental, uh, people's mental knowledge of being underwater and swimming is like holding your breath and swimming the length of a swimming pool. And if you've ever swam underwater, the length of a swimming pool, right? Uh, it's nerve wracking because you're kind of going, I, I don't have enough air to do this because you're holding your breath. And that's the association that a lot of people have with going underwater when they're scuba diving, because that's the only thing they've known when they first start learning how to scuba dive. And they don't recognize that they can just take a breath whenever they want to take a breath because the air is right there with a demand valve. You take a breath, air comes in. So, um, so yeah, panic is the reason why they start to hyperventilate. The other consideration though that you need to think about when it comes to diving and being underwater is that um, air is compressed at the, at, the, um, at the level of the atmospheric pressure, okay? So, we talked about going from zero feet to 18,000 feet, to 17,600 feet. When you go from zero feet to 18,000 feet, you have 18,000 feet has half of an atmosphere, right? So if I, you remember that I, I, had, a, I had a picture of a container and I said, I picked up a container of air at sea level and it had six molecules of oxygen in it. Do you remember that? Um, and that represented 21% of what was actually in the container. And then I went up to 18,000 feet and I picked up the same sized container, but it could only hold three molecules of oxygen plus all the nitrogen. The oxygen was still 21% of the total, but it was half the volume. Let me stop right there. Did everybody understand what I just said? I have a couple of blank stares. You working that out in your head, Riley? Is that good? Okay. S -s -s Ethan, was that a, you're jumping on to ask a question or you're just jumping on? <laughs> okay, cool. <clears throat> okay. So let me, let me say that again. At, at zero feet, I scoop up a container of air. In that container of air, I have 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 
And I'm telling you that it's a very small container. It holds six molecules of oxygen. It's a tiny little thimble of air. I go up to 18,000 feet. That same size thimble can only hold half the air because all of it has expanded. So I only get three molecules of oxygen plus half the nitrogen. Now, if I take that same size container and go to 33 feet under, underwater, where I have twice the pressure, and I scoop air into my same size container, how many molecules of oxygen will I have? If you're talking to me, Riley, you're muted. <laughs> okay. Do you guys understand what I'm asking? Waiting, waiting, waiting. Is that 14 or is it going half of the seven molecules on top of that? I started with six molecules. Oh, sorry, six. So 12 down there? Exactly. And when I pick up those 12 molecules of oxygen, what is the percentage of that oxygen to everything that's in that cup? Exactly, Kenji, 21%. So it's the same percentage of oxygen because I also picked up, I didn't just double the amount of oxygen I picked up, I doubled the amount of nitrogen I picked up as well at 33 feet. Does that make sense? That means my same size container holds twice as much air. So if my normal breath size, breath size, at sea level is 500 milliliters of air, if that's what I breathed in at sea level, if I breathe that same size breath, that physical size breath at 33 feet, how much total volume of air will I have in terms of sea level air at 33 feet? You'll have twice the amount. Exactly. I'll have a full liter of air. That full liter of air, when I'm thinking in terms of sea level air, that full liter of air will be packed into a 500 milliliter container. Does that make sense? Do y'all understand what I just said? But you're saying that's if we filled it up with air at 33 feet below sea level, right? Correct. So yes, that's, that's correct. So zero feet, 18,000 feet, and then 33 feet underwater, right? If I had 500 milliliters of air right here in a container, the, the thing that is fixed is the size of my container for this example. If I take that container up to 18,000 feet, the total volume of air that's going to be in that container, let's say that that container is a 500 milliliter container, okay? It holds, at sea level, it holds exactly 500 milliliters of air. Does that make sense? Are we good so far? When I go up to 18,000 feet, that same size container can only hold 250 milliliters, because that 250 milliliters will have expanded to fill that entire container. Does that make sense? We good so far? Now, if I cap this container, me drawing on this whiteboard, is that working for you guys? You can see what I'm doing? Yeah, yeah I can see what you're okay. doing. Okay, if I cap this container up here, so that no air can get out or go in. And then I bring that container back down to zero feet. Then how much will I actually have in there at zero feet? Do y'all understand what I just did? You're still gonna have the same amount 
of oxygen in that container though. That's correct. I'll have the same amount here. I want to know what the volume of that container is because this particular talk is not going to be about oh. the amount of, uh, amount of gas. It's going to be about the volume of total gas. Okay. So if I haven't, so I'm going to do this real slow because this is going to be critical for one of the components that we're about to hit, which is a huge problem with scuba diving. So I have a container. I have a 500 milliliter container right here. Okay. This holds only, this holds 500 milliliters at sea level. That's all that will fit in there. Okay. If I empty it out, so there's nothing in it and I take it up to 18,000 feet and fill it there, the container is still a 500 milliliter container, correct? Yes. Because the container is fixed in terms of its size. It will hold 500 milliliters of whatever is at 18,000 feet, right? If I, which is half the oxygen and half the nitrogen is what was at zero feet. If I then cap this container so that nothing can escape and I bring it back down to sea level, I want to know what the volume inside that container is actually going to be now. Is it going to be 125? What happens to the pressure at sea level compared to 18,000 feet? Increases. It does what? Increase. Increases. So if, the, if it increases in pressure, what's the gas going to do? The, volume, the gas is going to compress and go down. The volume is going to go down. There you go. So right, what's so my volume? I filled it here and I brought it here. What's my volume now? It's going to be less volume. How much? You can give me an exact number. Because I have one atmosphere here. I have a half of an atmosphere here. So if I fill it here, what happened? That was initially why I was thinking 125, but no But way. what does pressure do? If it's 125, that got less volume. Oh, you're right. That's less volume. Okay. So, so what is it actually? It's going to be 500. It's going to be 500. Does that make okay. sense? But yeah, because I mean, that's, what, like that's what's happening to the thing. But how much volume is it? So as I come down, so, I, so up here, my 500 milliliter container is going to be full, but the quantity of nitrogen and the quantity of oxygen is going to take up this entire space, but it's going to be half the volume as what is down here at sea level. Does that make okay, sense? I was thinking like every time you take a bag of potato chips up into the mountains, like it expands. Exactly. exactly what I was thinking. That is exactly what we're talking about. Okay. Right? So if I have, if I fill my container at 18,000 feet and I drop it down to sea level, it will no longer fill the container. It'll fill half the container because the gas inside there will have been compressed to half the volume. Does that make sense? Yep. yep. So if I have a 500 milliliter container that was full up here, when it comes here, it'll only be half full. So a 500 milliliter container would only be filled to 250 milliliters. Does that make sense? Yep. All right. I, I, because I can't see a whole lot of pictures, I, I need to have a moment of either verbal agreement or chat agreement or a bunch of yeses that you understand what I'm saying because it's going to be critical for the next component. <laughs> yep. Yeah, good to go. Good? Okay. Yes. Okay. So I have my 500 milliliter container. I empty it out. I take it under water to 33 feet and fill it with air right there. My container is a 500 milliliter container. I have filled it with 500 milliliters of air at 33 feet, which is two atmospheres of pressure.
So now I have 500 milliliters of air at the two atmosphere pressure level. I then cap my container so air can't get in or out. If I take it to sea level, how much air is going to be in my container when I get up to sea level? What's going to happen to the air as I go from 33 feet to zero feet? It's gonna escape. And I'm not allowing it to escape. Well, and let's say it's a flexible container so that it's, you know, it's made of rubber. So it's not gonna burst. What'll happen? It'll expand. Yeah, your volume will. By increase. how much? Twice. By uh, twice. So I had 500 milliliters at 33 feet. What do I have at zero feet? A thousand. I have a thousand milliliters at zero feet. Do you guys all understand that for a minute? Y'all good? Okay. Yeah. All right. Are you ready for it? <laughs> Here we go. I have somebody <clears throat> whose association with water in terms of swimming underwater is a swimming pool. When you swim underwater in a swimming pool, what are you doing with your breath? Katie, did you mouth just holding it? Yes, I did. yes, you're you're holding your breath. So you go you go underwater in a swimming pool, five, six, seven, eight feet deep, something like that, and you're swimming around underwater, holding your breath. So your association as you take a scuba diving class is to hold your breath underwater. Now you're sitting there going, hey guy, Riley, you wanna to learn to scuba dive? Sure, why not? Perfect. I'm gonna take you down to 33 feet. You're gonna have 33 feet of water over your head, right? Most okay. pools you go to have 10 to 12 feet depth of water, right? <laughs> I'm gonna put 33 feet over your head, of, of air, I'm sorry, of water over your head. And I'm gonna have you hang out there and then we're gonna do fun things underwater for a while, right? Maybe I'll take you down to 66 feet in just a minute, right? So you're at, you're at 33 feet. This is your first time scuba diving, right? If you're anxious, what did we already say anxiety ridden people are going to do with their breathing. They hyperventilate. They hyperventilate. Give me the adjectives for hyperventilation. There's two adjectives that describes hyperventilation always. You mean like shortness of breath? Nope. Two adjectives that describe, oh, there it is right there. Cameron put it in the, in the Fast chat. Fast and deep. So you're 33 feet. You're breathing fast and deep. That means you're not breathing at a lung volume of 500 milliliters tidal volume that you normally breathe, that you're all breathing right now, right? You're all relaxed right now for the most part. So you're breathing at 500 feet or at 500 milliliters of air right now, average. But we said that your lung capacity was what, give or take, a week or two ago? What's a lung capacity? If you're breathing, if you're breathing fast and deep because you're short of breath and you're trying to get breath in, how much can your lungs actually hold? 500 mils. That's your normal tidal breath, a half a liter. That's your normal tidal breath. How much can you hold? So I'm breathing right now, 500 mils, give or take. You see my chest barely moving. No big deal. You're all doing this. But then I do this. 
to take a deep breath, right? Yeah, so I'm seeing some numbers. Alan throws out 750, Kinji 1500. Guys, your lungs, depending on if you're male or female or whatever the case is and how much you've been working, you can hold anywhere from three to in some cases, five liters. That's your lung capacity when you're hyperventilating, right? Okay, so here it is. Are you ready for it? Your lung capacity. Let's pretend that your, let, let's give you the benefit of the doubt. Let's say Riley's our, our guinea pig because he's the one that's scuba diving, right? We, we couldn't pick on Andrew anymore, so I had to pick on Riley, right? Okay, Riley's, let's just give Riley the benefit of the doubt and say that his, he has got like freaking rock solid lungs and he's got six liters of lung volume. Let's just pretend, right? He's got six liters of lung volume because he's just that way. But he's nervous and anxious and he's hyperventilating. But he's only hyperventilating at two thirds the capacity of his lungs. Yeah, isn't that right, Natalie? So if he's nice. only breathing, if he's breathing, if he's hyperventilating at two thirds the capacity of his lungs, what are the size of his breaths right now in volume? I know we're doing lots of math. You're not saying that out loud, Riley. Or you're Is muted. it 4,000? There we go. Natalie does it too. But you're right. That's four liters. Okay. So here's the deal. He's breathing at two thirds the volume of his lungs. He's not even at his lung capacity yet. He's breathing two thirds the volume of his lungs. So he's taking in four liters. But he's nervous. And one of the one of the things that we have to teach him how to do underwater is to take all of his crap off and get to the surface. Drop his weight belts and get to the surface. But Riley's only association with underwater up till now has been swimming in a swimming pool. And what does he do underwater in a swimming pool? Hold my breath. That's right. So now you're at 33 feet. Oh. You know that we're about to, you know that what we're about to do to you, we're going to take your equipment off and make you get to the surface. You take an extra big breath, but hey, we're still gonna be kind to you and say you're only taking two thirds of your max breath. So you take in a four liter breath, panic, hold your breath and skyrocket your swimming to the surface. What happens by the time he gets to zero feet? It's expanded twice as much, and I've been holding my to breath what the leader, time. To what liters now? 8,000. Eight. Yeah, to 8,000 my... milliliters, to eight liters. He went from four liters to eight. What was the capacity of his lungs? And we gave him the benefit of the doubt. So he just went two liters beyond the capacity of his lungs because he held his breath going to the surface. And now physics just did something to Riley. Guess what it did? This is what it did to him. Can you read that? Because as he's swimming, <laughs> give him an F, yes. <laughs> Because he's swimming to the surface, he's swimming so quickly to get to the surface that he can't even understand that his lungs are overexpanding. And because he's panicked and because you have con because respiratory rate is voluntary also, he's closed his mouth and he's controlling his breathing. In this case, he's controlling it by not breathing. And by the time he gets to the surface, He's already overexpanded his lungs and he's burst out his, his alveoli. And now his air pot, his air, his air sacs are burst and broken. And you have something called overinflation syndrome. 
So the thing that we have to teach people, the thing that they have to learn right off the bat is to be able to go underwater. And as you're swimming to the surface, you do something that goes completely against all of your instincts. You have to blow your air out the entire time. And the funky thing that people don't get is that they, they associate, I can't swim a 25 foot swimming pool underwater without almost dying. This is what people think. Because they're swimming underwater horizontally, they go, I can't go 25 feet without barely making it and having to get a breath. How on earth am I going to do it from 33 feet? But guess what, Riley? We don't do this technique at 33 feet. We do it at 60. 60 feet is three atmospheres of pressure at 66 feet. That means if you take a four liter breath at 66 feet and hold your breath, if you made it all the way to zero feet, what's your volume going to be? Anybody can throw, I'm not picking on Riley anymore. Anyone can throw it out. Say that again, say that out loud. God dang, okay, it's still 12. <laughs> That's right. That means you went from four liters to 12 liters, which even giving you the benefit of the doubt is double what your lungs can handle. That means you don't even make it to zero feet because on the way up, you blew out your lungs before you even got that far. Now you're underwater with blown out air sacs and we've got a problem. So we teach people to go down to 60 feet and to slowly rise while blowing out their air. And the amazing thing is, is as your blow, you took four liters of breath down here, but you took 12 liters in terms of sea level volume, right? You took three times the size of a breath at this, at 66 feet, than you would have taken at zero feet. You fit three times the amount of the volume of oxygen into the, your container than you would have had at zero feet. That means as you're rising and you're blowing out the air, it's expanding in your chest as you're blowing it out, which means you get all the way to the surface having never felt like you are out of breath at any point in time. Yep, go ahead, Riley. So at, say at three atmospheres below sea level, when you take that breath in from your bottle, I guess I'm still trying to wrap it around. Does that mean that your supposed bottle life is a third because you're taking in more volume? So you have shorter time down there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, so that's the trade off. So if you understand what Riley just said, when, when you go underwater, if you, if you have a certain volume, a total volume of air at sea level and you go down to 33 feet, you're going to move through that bottle twice as quickly because every volume is going to every breath you because um, at sea level, it's a fixed volume. And you're taking that fixed volume down to 33 feet, but packing it into half the volume of the tank, which means every breath you take burns twice as much air. That is correct. Every breath you take burns twice as much air. So the trade off is you go through more air down there, right? because you burn through your tank faster. But at the same time, you have more air in your lungs as you go back up and therefore you're never out of breath. Try to wrap your head around that. So I know like in, in fire, they always talk about like if, if you're doing like minimal work or something and you're in your turnouts and everything, you're supposed to like hum to make your breath go longer. Do they do the same thing for scuba diving? Because I feel like yeah, that and there's, there's a variety of different techniques that people will use, but that is one way is just to make sound with your mouth all the time because it, it forces you to be blowing out the entire time. Is that why CO like I might be remembering this wrong, but why COPD patients like breathe through like pursed lips? So pursed lip breathing is because they 
um, they don't have the recoil in their lungs. And so they're pushing the air out all the time. So you and I, when I say you and I, I mean, anybody who doesn't have C COPD, we don't, um, the, the exhalation is not active. We just let our lungs do the thing, the thing they're going to do with mm -hmm. COPD patients. They have to actually physically do it. Gotcha. Their exhalation is active. Ours is not. Would someone really do that? Would they be forced to exhale or would there, or would there be a popping? Um, v, that's an excellent question. So V is asking, would someone really do that? As in you're asking, would they really hold their breath as they're going to the surface and let their lungs expand to the point of damage? I, I think that's what your question is. Is that correct, V? Oh, she disappeared. Uh, I'll answer it anyway. Um, Yes, the, the, the reality is that as you are going up, would people really do that? They don't have time to not. When they, when, they drop their, when they drop their weight belts and they start going to the surface, they rise to the surface so quickly that they can't stop themselves before they get to the surface. And they just, they don't have time to do what they need to do because they're not controlling their ascent. So yeah, people, people do it. And they, it's what causes the, some of the big problems here. Good. Now that you mentioned that, Corey, I feel like I've noticed a difference like when I've been on like the bottom of the deep end of the pool and even coming up and noticing like that, even it's like even a, only a third atmosphere difference. Yeah, well, the thing is, so swimming pool is a little bit funky because um, in terms of volume of breath with a swimming pool, you take a breath at the surface, you hold your breath going down, and you can hold it coming back up because you, your volume was set at sea level. With scuba diving, oh. you're breathing the volume in the tank, so your volume is set underwater, under pressure. So there's a, a little bit of a difference there. So you can hold your breath in a swimming pool and go up and down, because you didn't take the breath underwater. You took the breath at the surface. So as you took the breath at the surface, maybe you took a liter breath at the surface. When you dove down, the breath got smaller when you got to the bottom. And when you came back up, it expanded again, but it only expanded to the size that you took the original breath. Right, but I would have possibly felt it expanding a little bit when I was doing it. Yeah, you, okay. you can. Yep, yeah, that's right which is very different than taking the breath underwater <laughs> with air, right? And that, that's where the, this is where the problem comes into play. So, okay, so problem number, problem number one that uh, I, I have for you guys is scuba divers can have what we call um, pulmonary overinflation syndrome. And that's where they hold their breath coming back up. When they hold their breath coming back up and that air expands, and because this is most commonly happens in a new person and they're not used to blowing out their air because they're panicked and they think they need to conserve the air and they're panicked so they they rise too fast then it causes their lungs to overexpand and they burst out their um their, low, their little airways um, you might have all kinds of problems um, one they might get subcutaneous air in their chest um, they're going to have difficulty breathing. They might even have difficulty swallowing because as that air expands, it actually can cause them damage to their esophagus as well. Uh, and you might end up with a pneumothorax. They, you might end up bursting their, their pleural cavity and you end up with a pneumothoracy. Um, so they, uh, they, they obviously have a, um, a lot of repair that has to go to their lungs if they're going to survive it one of the concerns that can happen is they can get an arterial gas embolism as well. Um, so as they're expanding and all that air is bursting, that air is now available. If that air is interacting with their, um, starts to interact with their bloodstream, you can sometimes get an air embolus in the bloodstream as well. And that can lead to some problems. It can lead to a stroke. It can lead to um, a myocardial infarction from a blockage. Um, it can obviously have the, the pneumothorax that we've already talked about. Um, all of those are, are possible issues with um, going up too quickly without blowing out your air. So yeah, big, big problems. Uh, Kenji, you say, I didn't think about that. Is that when we were talking about the swimming pool and where you're taking your air, whether you're taking it at the surface versus taking it um, underwater from a tank? Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's amazing. Okay. So that's one problem. <laughs> one scuba diving problem. I'm going to scare you away from scuba diving. I don't want to. Scuba diving is fantastic, especially in Oregon. You can go play with the sea lions. They like to play tag with you. It's fantastic. You can have all kinds of fun. Um, okay. So problem number two, or a, a second major problem that we have with, um, that we have with scuba diving is that we are breathing air. When we breathe air, we've already talked about some of the oxygen things you can have. And in fact, if you breathe it too long, you can get an oxygen toxicity, um, which goes into play with how many chemical reactions we're getting from that oxygen and how much of that reaction, that reactive oxygen species that we're producing, okay? But one of the, one of the more common things that happens is um, how long the scuba diver is underwater is a, is a huge issue, okay? When we are breathing air underwater, we are breathing 21% oxygen, but what else are we breathing? The breath we take underwater has 21% oxygen, but what else does it have? Nitrogen. Also has nitrogen. 78% of the air that we're pulling in is nitrogen. Nitrogen, when it's under pressure, I think I mentioned this a week or two ago, nitrogen, when it's under pressure, takes on properties that are similar to a liquid, which means when we're at sea level, breathing in our air, the nitrogen is inert. It goes in, it goes out. It's just a, a vehicle to help with air coming in and out. And it's only the oxygen and the carbon dioxide that has any real exchange with our body. But when you put nitrogen under pressure, nitrogen starts seeping into our bloodstream. It crosses the barrier and it starts entering our bloodstream, okay? Because nitrogen enters our bloodstream and it is compressed, it's now in a closed container. If we then go to the surface, the nitrogen is going to do what? It's going to become gas and expand. When it expands in our bloodstream, it causes problems because it went from basically seeming like a liquid and mixing with our blood to now going back to its normal size, which is clearly an, a, a gas. And now we have this gas that's in our bloodstream circulating around, and that creates a problem. Okay, so a number of years ago, um, there was a dam being built. It was a big dam. It was a dam on the Colorado River. Do you all know where the Colorado River is? Any of you know where the Colorado River is? Can anyone know what dam I'm talking about? The Hoover Dam. The Hoover Dam. All right. It's not in Colorado. It's actually in, in Vegas, in uh, Nevada. It's at the end of the Grand Canyon, and it's the Hoover Dam. When they were building the Hoover Dam. Originally, they were damming up the Colorado River and they were building the Hoover Dam. There was uh, a, uh, <laughs> there, there was a community of the workers that were working on the dam and they had a variety of underwater welders and underwater builders. And what they would do is they would, they would go underwater to, uh, to do whatever the work they were doing and they piped the air to them. So they, they had tubes of air that they piped down underwater to them. So they were in suits underwater and air was being piped to the surface. So air was coming from the surface, but they were breathing the air underwater, which means they were breathing pressurized air. Now that wasn't, we weren't at 33 feet at that time when they were first building it, the, the water was building, but um, what would happen is they would breathe underwater. And as they were breathing underwater, that nitrogen was under pressure. And as the nitrogen was under pressure, they got more of that nitrogen in, into their bloodstream. And then they would just come up at night and go back to, their, to the village that was the, the, the community that they built. They built a community of people that were working on the Hoover Dam. And what would happen is the, the people that worked underwater started to get a bunch of joint pains, their elbows, their knees, 
they would have these pains that they would have and they, um, they didn't know what it was and they started to refer to it as, in, in relation to where the damage was, which was in these joints. So they lovingly referred to it as the bends. They started to get the bends. They couldn't straighten out their arms. Their joints were bent and their joints were in a lot of pain. So they called it the bends. We later found out that the bends was uh, a product of um, a buildup of nitrogen in their bloodstream that their body wasn't getting rid of because it got trapped underwater. They would come to the surface, it would re-expand and that was trapped in their bloodstream. Um, and then they would go back underwater the next day, build up more of it, come back to the surface and there was even more nitrogen in their bloodstream. And as it started to build more and more nitrogen in their bloodstream, the nitrogen started to cause problems with blocking th things. Sometimes it blocked arteries and it killed them or it blocked arteries and caused bigger problems. Sometimes it just caused pain because it couldn't, the air, uh, the gas in the bloodstream couldn't get around joints very well because circulation is difficult around those joints. Um, and so we started to find out that we had something called, de um, we later on, as, as we found out it was nitrogen, it got a name and it was called decompression sickness. Decompression sickness is because as the air decompressed, it was compressed underwater. As it decompressed at the surface, uh, it started to cause problems with our body. Now in scuba diving, we're going down to 66 feet to 60 feet. So 60 feet is the, is the um, basic open water diver depth that you learn to go. Um, there's a, another one advanced that goes down to 100 feet. And then there's some deep, deep diving stuff you can do. Um, but now that we're at 66 feet, we're breathing a lot of nitrogen. So scuba divers will actually have a, a chart that they follow that tells them how much time they can remain at a certain depth um, and how much residual nitrogen they're going to have in their body. And you have to follow that closely. If, um, if you have too much residual nitrogen, then you get into decompression sickness that can cause brain tra trauma, it can cause um, pulmonary problems, it can cause heart problems. So you have to keep track of how much nitrogen will have been built up in your body and don't exceed that because we have now learned how much nitrogen our body can actually take care of at sea level and for how long. So, there, so each, dive, each dive that a scuba diver does has a specific time limit to it at the depth that they're going to go. And every subsequent dive that a scuba diver does in a given trip, um, each dive is to a shallower depth. So your first dive is always the deepest you're going to do. And each time you're underwater, it's for less time until you've finished your trip. And you plan your trip and your depth based on, um, based on this residual nitrogen that you're, that you're going to build. And then you have problems, right? Because what's going to happen to nitrogen if I go from sea level and go up to Everest? What's it going to do now? That's right, V, it's going to expand even more. And now it's in your bloodstream. So not only do scuba divers have to pay attention to their residual nitrogen, they also have to plan when they're going to be in an airplane. Because airplanes are pressurized to eight to 10,000 feet, not at sea level. The pressurization in an airline is not at sea level. So you have to account for that extra 8,000 to 10,000 feet of pressure of depressurization you're going to have in an airplane on top of your scuba diving trip. So you have a whole lot of things to consider. Um, and then if you choose to, to learn how to do altitude diving, like if you guys wanted to go up to Clear Lake up in up on the, the headwaters of the McKinsey River, it's a beautiful lake. It's a fantastic lake to scuba dive. But now you're scuba diving at altitude. So now it's you're at a whole different level of things you have to consider while you're also up there. Um, so decompression sickness. One, once, uh, some things to keep in mind, um, you've got a lot of joint pain. Uh, they might have a lot of joint pain. It might actually lead to some paralysis for a period of time or numbness. Um, they might have some bowel obstructions or not being able to, um, to work their bladder system properly. 
Um, some people will actually get rashes and start to look a little mottled, um, and they might have some central nervous system changes. Uh, typically, the, the treatment for decompression sickness is to get them to a recompression chamber. So they're gonna have to, typically we're gonna put them in a chamber. We're gonna put them in a chamber and um, pressurize the air. And then we're going to increase the amount of oxygen that's in that container. And the goal here is for them to breathe a different percentage of air that is less nitrogen and let their body slowly work that nitrogen out and then, um, and then move on from there. Um, so for example, um, people who do deep water diving or are in deep water drilling rigs who are underwater for extensive periods of time, they can't just come back to the surface. They actually have to come to certain levels within the water and stay there for a while to let their body work the nitrogen out and before they continue to come up. So they have to recompress before they can come up. That's not the case for Navy men in a submarine. The submarine is actually pressurized to sea level pressure. Uh, and it's the hull of the submarine that actually takes on the pressure. So um, the air pressure inside the submarine is not matched to the pressure of the water on the outside so that the submarine can go up and down without affecting the people inside. The air that people inside the submarine breathe is sea level air all the time. And it's the structure of the submarine itself that allows it to be underwater withstanding the pressure of the water. That's not the case when you talk about deep water drilling and people who do deep, deep sea diving and that kind of thing. They act, they're breathing air that is pressurized at the sea level, not at the surface level. Does that make sense? So they have to be recompressed as they come back up. Um, typically, you'll have to get them to a recompression chamber. There's not a whole lot of those around. Portland has one, San Francisco has one, Seattle has one, but they're not at all hospitals. So not only do they have to get them there, they also have to have the capabilities of get them, getting them there in a, in a low altitude vehicle. So either they're gonna have to have a low altitude fixed wing flight or a low altitude helicopter because they can't take them up to 35,000 feet and fly them there. So you have to be able to get them to the chamber quickly and you have to be able to get them to the chamber without causing more problems by causing the air to expand even further. Decompression sickness. Okay, what questions did I just raise? Everybody good? It is so stinking silent. Actually, I do have a question. What about skydiving? Uh, what are you asking about skydiving? In terms like, of are you, the, these kinds of things? Like, are you, are you dropping from a height that the pressure is changing too quickly? No, um, typically you're, you're going up to eight to 10,000 feet and jumping. So if you were to do um, if you're to do a high altitude jump ever, uh, um, then you'd actually be wearing oxygen. You'd be wearing, you'd be wearing a mask and breathing oxygen. Um, uh, it doesn't matter going down because air is compressing. So none of these problems are a problem going down. Air gets, gets uh, tighter as opposed to expanded. Um, and if you go out and do any sort of uh, sky, skydiving here, if, I mean, if you just want to learn how to skydive for the first time, they're gonna take you up to you know, 10,000 feet and you're gonna jump. So you might, uh, some people kind of have some of the effects of high altitude because you're in, a, in an open air plane the whole time. It's never pressurized, uh, but for the most part, you're not gonna have any effects. And then when you jump, everything gets better as you go down. Uh, gets better is relative, of course, right? And it kind of depends on how good your instructors are and how good they were at packing the parachute. <clears throat> things might get worse, I suppose. Especially if you survive. 
What's that, Caroline? Especially if you survive impact. <laughs> yeah. Your, your survivability won't have anything to do with your breathing in that case. <laughs> that was a good question, though. If you do go up at a higher altitude, you would have to, um, you would have, to have a suit that has um, the ability to breathe oxygen. Right, and um, fighter pilots, I, I, I don't know if any of you are Top Gun fans or whatever, um, but if you ever watch fighter pilots, they have a mask that they put on and take off. Um, they put that mask on anytime they're about ready to fly to an altitude. That's because they have to breathe. Um, they have to breathe the oxygen because of how they don't have the option, right? They're going up and down. They have to be able to breathe oxygen at higher altitudes in order to make sure that they don't black out. Um, but if you're a test pilot and you're really going as high as you can in, in, a, um, in a test flight of some sort, you can't just breathe oxygen. You actually have to be in a pressurized suit so that you can actually have pressurized oxygen at altitude. Good, those are great questions. Other questions? All your questions are answered. Okay, there's one more thing that nitrogen does that you should go, oh, wait a minute. What pressure is used for a positive pressurized? Um, yeah, that's a good question, Bruce. It depends on what the, what the um, uh, let me change that. Are you talking about uh, like if you just need to have positive pressure or demand valve, or are you talking about in a recompression chamber? So most of the demand valves, um, <clears throat> like the demand valves that you'll see for EMS and that kind of stuff, um, when you push the when you when you push the the button to let the air out, it actually is sending the air at the at the level of the tank, um, and it's and you have to pay very close attention to um, what you're trying to what you're trying to do to not overinflate lungs. Um, and you only, you have to be careful of what age you do it and, and that kind of thing. Um, so it's a little bit different than say setting a, a CPAP or something where you can actually set the, um, set the centimeters of water or set the pressure. Um, the, those, uh, those valves actually just send uh, the pressure at the, at the speed that the tank would release it if you just opened the tank wide open. Um, so you have to be really careful about what you're doing to, to not blow somebody's uh, airways out. They're not used that much anymore just because they weren't able to be used. Um, um, I, I don't want to say they just weren't very efficient and people were causing problems with them. And we can do better with a bag valve mask than with those so, so often they're not used anymore. <clears throat> okay, there is one more thing that happens with nitrogen. This is fun-ish kind of with nitrogen. Um, because nitrogen enters your bloodstream when you're underwater, uh, when you get around 100 feet or so in the, in the 60 to 100 foot range, uh, the reason, uh, one of the big reasons why an open water scuba diving certificate only, uh, only certifies you to go down to 60 feet is because as you get closer to 100 feet, the amount of nitrogen that's entering your bloodstream starts to have a, a central nervous system effect. Uh, and you get something called nitrogen narcosis. And so at about 100 feet or so, um, nitrogen starts to interact with your central nervous system and it starts to make you act um, drunk or high. You're down there and you start to have hallucinations. Um, you'll start to see like pretty rainbow fish swimming by that aren't really there. Um, and you can watch, it, it's fun to watch people when they do this. Um, so you go down there with them. You, you learn those effects. Um, if, you, if you're a, a scuba diver that's commonly down that, at that depth, you start to understand what those effects are with you and you can start to play through it. You can start to um, acclimatize yourself to those effects. Uh, but the first, first time somebody ever goes down there and they start to do it, 
uh, it's pretty wild. I mean, they'll, they'll watch, they'll try to give the fish their regulator to let the fish breathe a little bit. They'll, they'll do all kinds of loopy things. And so you have, you need to have someone down there to help you <laughs> when you have those effects. Um, it's cool if they have a camera too, and they can like video what you're doing. If it's clear water, that's fantastic too. Um, but it does, if someone goes down there who isn't accustomed to being down there and you don't have somebody with you that can help you, you can get yourself into trouble just because you start acting drunk and you start acting um, loopy and you start doing things that, that um, where you lose your judgment. And so you can get yourself into trouble. It doesn't have a lasting effect other than the things we've already talked about in terms of nitrogen being in your bloodstream. So all you have to do is go up and as soon as you get up to the 60 feet range, it goes away. Um, but when you get down uh, close to 100 feet, that starts to happen to a lot of people, um, to most people at least a little bit, um, more or less to some people. Um, and uh, they, yeah, they, they, uh, they get pretty loopy and you just have to watch them to make sure they don't do something weird that's going to get them into trouble until they learn to understand the, the effects that it's having on their body and they can learn to play through that. So that's sort of wholesome. Yeah, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's fun to watch. There's all kinds of fun things you can do underwater that probably aren't the safest, but are fun. But that's a story for another time. Okay, now questions on anything so far. Everybody good there? Hello? Hello. Hello. Sorry, sorry. I'm storing on my audio. <laughs> I was wondering, does that, does that effect go away, the nitrogen sickness effect, or do people just learn to get used to it and know, and they just deal with it or no, enjoy it, it or it, whatever? It goes away. The more you dive, the more your body becomes attuned to it and you kind of figure out how it affects your body and it, it doesn't affect people. So, some people it affects like for a longer window of time, but everybody learns how to, to deal with it. It is also why um, going down to 100 feet in most um, certifying scuba diving agencies, um, it, why that's an advanced certificate because they, you know, they want you to get under there and dive at 60 feet all you want, but going down deeper, they want to make sure that you're, you're supervised. Then there's a difference between if you're using wetsuits versus dry suits. Um, dry suits are designed to keep you dry. That's Kind of why their name is dry suit. I, that's, it's amazing, but it is. Wetsuits work by, um, so neoprene, neoprene is uh, water occlusive. In other words, water cannot come in and out of, of neoprene. So, well, why is a wetsuit a wetsuit then? Um, wetsuits are designed for you to get wet. So when you go underwater, um, you, you actually open up your wetsuit to get water between you and the wetsuit. If you're really smart, uh, you bring warm water with you. And before you get in the cold water, you dump warm water inside your wetsuit. That way you don't have to use cold water, but that's beside the point. The point is that you get water between you and the wetsuit. And then when you go underwater, no water can come in and out of that wetsuit. Your body warms up that layer of water between you and the neoprene. And that layer of water between you and the neoprene is now your insulation. So you're water insulated to the cold water. Um, and that's how you stay warm in a wetsuit. Um, dry suits are such that, that you've, got a, um, you've got cuffs on your wrists and neck that, um, uh, that don't allow water to get in and your, um, your booties are actually molded to the, to the dry suit. So there is no opening in your feet. Um, and in that case, you're not, you're not lose, using water to keep yourself warm. You're using air to keep yourself warm. So you actually inflate the dry suit with a layer of air and your, your regulator has a separate little fitting that hooks onto your dry suit and you can actually increase and decrease the air inside your dry suit. Um, so you, you deal with air inside the dry suit. Now, the problem with the dry suit, it takes a, another level of kind of certification to do it because the problem with the dry suit is that air can escape in your neck, air can escape in your wrists, and you usually have an outlet valve that will let air escape from your dry suit. 
but it can't escape your feet. And the problem that people get into is they will fill their, there's a button that allows you to pump air into your dry suit. You fill air with your dry suit. And if your feet, as you're swimming horizontally, if your feet come up above your hair, up above your head, where's all the air that's in the dry suit going to go? Yeah, it goes to your feet. And as it goes to your feet, you wind up upside down. And what does air do as you kind of go up just a little bit? What does air do? Yeah, that's right, it expands. And as it expands, it floats. And then it expands, and then it floats. And so people will get themselves upside down and they can't get the air out of their, out of their uh, suit. If they can't get the air out of the suit, they can float all the way to the surface. Some dives, when you're underwater for a, a, a certain window of time, you have to do safety stops. As you're coming up from depth, there are certain stops you have to do for you know, a minute or two minutes at a, given, at a given altitude to let the nitrogen work out. But if you're in a dry suit that got your feet all full of air, you'll float all the way to the surface. And if you miss your safety stop, it'll put you right into decompression sickness. So you have to learn how to, part of the certification for a dry suit is to learn how to get out of that situation so that you can roll yourself back and make sure you get rid of the air out of the dry suit. And of course, to not get in that situation in the first place. So it's a little bit complicated to using a dry suit, but in Oregon, dry suits are fantastic, man. It means cold water really isn't cold water anymore. <clears throat> so, all right. What questions did I create in all of that? Where can we go in Oregon to get a scuba diving cert? You happen to have, and I, I, I'm not trying to sell anything here, <laughs> but you happen to have one of the best scuba diving organizations in the country right here in Eugene. Um, Eugene Skin Diver Supply down on 6th Street are absolutely fantastic. Um, they've been owned by the same guy for a long time. Uh, they do all the classes at the U of O and, and uh, the other uh, places that, that classes happen. Um, they're fantastic and they're, they do PADI classes, P-A-D-I, PADI classes, which is absolutely the, the certification you wanna have. PADI is probably the most renowned um, scuba diving training organization and they do everything for the most part, the right way. Um, so if you're interested, I would say, go find out what kind of classes are happening at Eugene Skin Diver Supply. They're on uh, 6th and, um, I don't know, Monroe-ish. They're, they're just past the Washington Jefferson Street Bridge, a couple of blocks on the left-hand side. They've been there for years and they're fantastic. And they know their stuff and they're safe. They do things well. Um, your certification dives will either be in Wohink over in Florence or um, up in, in the, uh, the Puget Sound. And they're, they're fantastic. They do a really good job. What's their name? Eugene Skin Diver Supply. One last Thank question, you. how much? You know, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know for sure, but my suspicion is it's right around a couple hundred dollars for you to have the entire class, to go through the entire class. The, the thing about scuba diving is this, um, uh, it is both an expensive and inexpensive sport if you choose to do it. Um, after you've gotten your certification, uh, you can actually rent everything that you need for give or take about $40. Um, now I'm, I'm dating myself because I don't know price increases in the last years and I own all my stuff, but, um, but give or take right around 40 or $50 will give you a weekend's worth of all your stuff. So for a, you know, uh, an expense for a, for a movie night, you can actually have a weekend's full, you know, full of scuba diving. Um, and they'll give you, they'll give you a couple tanks. Um, and if you want, you can get those tanks refilled on site. So for example, if you went to Florence, there's shops over there that you can actually get the tanks refilled if you wanted to do it. And the refill of a tank is like six bucks or something like that. So 40 or 50 bucks gives you everything that you need. You can rent everything you need. If you want to buy your stuff, it's it's expensive, but What's expensive. Yeah, um, 
you're you're into it for you know anywhere from maybe eight hundred to fifteen hundred dollars for everything if you want it and that's that's if you went like a dry suit you know wetsuits are going to be dependent on the thickness that's going to be a couple hundred dollars the tanks are a couple hundred dollars your bcd which is the most important thing you're going to have is going to be you know 250 300 dollars but that's but stuff it lasts never, like 10 years at least it, it's going to last forever you, it'll never go it'll never go out the the only thing that's going to determine if you want to get something new is if you chose you wanted a different style right it but but in terms of the like the neoprene doesn't go bad the tanks as long as you keep them serviced they never go bad um so for the most part things just don't go bad and you can have them for for a long time i've, I've got my dry suit that i have and my equipment that i have is um uh, let's see. I bought what I bought my current set of stuff in 2001 and I use it all the time. Still it's, it's fantastic stuff. So it's really you, the expense to buying the stuff. It's perfectly okay to get used gear. So the expense to buying stuff is just your personal choice. But after you own the gear, you're talking about four to $6 to fill a tank. That's it. That's your expense. Being's more expensive. So, oh my gosh, skiing is so much more expensive. It's ridiculous. Yeah, uh, that's it's just silly to compare the two expense wise. <laughs> yeah. Great. What other questions do you have? I think you all should go scuba diving. At least take a class and go have, go see what it's like, man. It's fantastic. If you do a little bit deeper stuff, um, we'd get into kind of a different talk. Uh, we use gas mixtures. If you're going to go deep, if you're going to go deep and want to stay under for a, a while, uh, we stop breathing nitrogen. I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. Also, we'll start um, breathing something like helium. We'll do a helium oxygen mix instead of a nitrogen oxygen mix. Um, helium, you can go a little bit deeper on before you get effects from helium. So, um, so being able to do like a, a heliox or, um, uh, nitrox, which is a different ratio of oxygen and nitrogen. Um, those are all things that you can do uh, to be able to go deeper and not have the same effects of nitrogen. Um, so um, there, there, there are other gas mixtures that you can get into uh, to, to do deep diving stuff. So, okay, other questions? Everybody good? You're looking like you're ragged. You've had a lot of information thrown at you. <laughs> Let's see. We've had four weeks of class, five weeks of class. I don't know that you've done. You've done six months worth of work in the short time we've been together at a time when society is like crumbling all over us for all kinds of reasons. <laughs> Definitely a brain bender. That's right. <laughs> An EMT smoothie. I like that. That's right. All right. Um, I'm not going to fill you with anything more today. You, you've, you've got it hit. You've got a lot. So um, tomorrow we meet up for more skills and I will be here to see you tomorrow. Um, so any questions, comments, concerns at the moment? Um, will this be available? Um to see, because I know, I know it's been recorded. Will these videos be up for us to see? Yeah, Jenny and I talked about that. Um, the other ones should be loaded or are being loaded, and this one will as well. So everything that we're going to record, everything that we have recorded, will absolutely be available for you to look. So, um, did uh, did she send a link to you guys yet on it? Okay. Um, I don't know if she was going to try to load the actual recording into Moodle or if she was going to send you a, an external link that gets you to the recordings. Um, but yeah, everything that we've recorded is, is yours to, to go back and review if you want to. Thank you very much. Yeah, I will see what her plan was today on whether or not she was sending a link or um, trying to upload it into Moodle. I have another question. When can yeah. we our national tests because we have to take a national and a state right okay so yeah i'll talk a little bit about the testing process um all of uh, all of your practical you have you have two licensing processes to go through skills 
and a written test, okay? The, to, to do licensing. All of your skills are, will be done within the context of the class. We'll work that, um, so you'll do some of them tomorrow, some of them Thursday, some of you will have a little bit more to do after that, but all of that will be done automatically within the class. Once you have completed all of the didactive stuff, um, we have all your homework in, all that kind of stuff, and after you've done your clinical experiences, once all of that is completed, then I will actually clear you to be able to take your licensing exam. And either tomorrow or Thursday, we'll walk through the computer stuff so you can set up your accounts, okay? Um, and, I'll, and I'll explain as I'm, as I'm helping you set up the accounts, I will explain how to go back to it to take your written exam. So as soon as, as, soon as your clinical stuff is done and we're not waiting for anything from you in any way, um, you'll be cleared to take that exam. And uh, that exam can also be taken here at Lane at the testing center. It's a, it's a Pearson View test, so it's done through a different organization. Um, but Lane's an authorized uh, um, provider of that test. And we just actually, last week, I, I walked through their testing center to help them get everything set so they can reopen to do those tests. So, um, and that'll be done at your discretion to a certain degree. I'll let you know, I'll, I'll give you guys a, a sign up that says these are the times that it's available and, and then you can just sign up for when you want to do it. Thank you. Good. Um, I was wondering, are, are we going to be able to be finished with this class soon enough to take the advanced intermediate one? Like, is this, is this, we'll be yep, able so to the, take it? The, yeah, the advanced class won't start until the fall. Um, and you guys uh, should be done long before that. Uh, the only the only thing that would prevent you from completing stuff in time to to do that um, advanced class, if you chose to, uh, would be if you chose to delay your own testing because you're you're in control of when you do that written test. I mean, I'll give you the the dates and times that it's available, but you're in control of it, and you actually have 24 months. To do that if you wanted to take that long that's ridiculous but because uh, you'll you lose the the knowledge over that time um but that's on you in terms of how much time you want to take to do it um uh, but yeah you, you uh you would have plenty of time to get it done in time to, to do i'm you'd be able to get it done two months in advance and still be fine uh is it full and doug is teaching it yes uh, it is not currently full because we haven't actually opened it to registration. We do, we know roughly who wants to, to be in it, but we haven't opened it to registration yet. So it's not currently full. Um, Doug is going to be the lead for it. He won't be the only instructor in it. Um, I'll teach some of the stuff. Other people will teach some of the stuff, but Doug will definitely be leading that class. Other questions? All right. Then I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Enjoy a little bit of sunshine that's still out there. Thanks again, Corey. You bet. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs>